Well, welcome to today's webinar. We've entitled the, Learning, the, the Leadership Edge, Discovering Your Company's Hidden Talent Pools. I'm Jack Zenger. I will be one of the presenters for today's uh, webinar. I'm really pleased to have joining me today uh, a colleague of more than 15 years, uh, Amy Pasquale. Uh, she is an exceptional coach, leadership expert, facilitator. Amy, I'm, I'm thrilled to have you join me today in this presentation. Toward the end of our webinar, you'll also be hearing from Brianna Corum, who will be offering to you, we hope, an enticing um, opportunity. And so you'll be hearing from her later on. And finally, we're uh, assisted today by Jennifer Lambert, our senior client executive. Uh, she will be manning the, the chat room for us. So if you have questions or if you want have requests or want more information, please type that in the chat box and she will do her best to respond to you. So um, as we begin, I would start by saying there is an urgent need for leadership. Corporate America is facing a talent crisis. A recent survey among executives indicated that, that in their perception, 77% uh, thought that acquiring capable, talented leadership was the most critical barrier to them achieving the kind of growth that they had hoped for. Now, I know that we're seeing some announcements of, of layoffs in some big tech companies, and it may be a little bit puzzling, but the reality is our employment rate is down to about three and a half percent in in North America. Uh, when I was a graduate student in, in economics years ago, um, 4% unemployment was considered just frictional, people moving from one job to another in a very natural way. So few people expect this talent shortage to go away. So today's webinar is our attempt to address that for you. And so Amy, tell them the solution. <laughs> yes, over to me to solve this problem. Actually, over to all of you to solve this problem. And so what we're here to do is shine some lights on some talent pools you may be overlooking. So that's the first thing we'll accomplish today. Where might you go looking? And the second is when you find these folks, how are we going to accelerate their development and growth so they can contribute at even greater levels? Let's just start by reminding ourselves, well, what are the benefits of hiring from within? Because they are many. We'll start with this idea that certainly it elevates employee commitment. So we see folks are moving ahead and we say, oh, that could happen to me. And in fact, that improves my ability or willingness to stay in the firm versus saying, you know what, I need to go look somewhere else because I'm not going to make any progress here. This also really de-risks the situation for both me, the person who's moving to senior ranks and the firm, because there's already some degree of organizational fit that's been ascertained. And lastly, as one moves ahead, there's spaces that are created. And so organizational mobility is often one um, a firm is seeking to um, create. So we can actually get our talent unstuck and mobilize throughout. Uh, this in turn makes the firm much more attractive um, to people outside of it because it's seen as a place where people can grow. And from a bottom line perspective, we don't have to go out and hire a recruiting company to go find these folks somewhere else. So the diamonds are within our firm and how do we find them? We're going to look at four groups. So already you're getting some information about where to start your hunt. The first is with women. The second is with new supervisors and new team leaders. And the third, individual contributors and STEM experts, science, technology, engineering, math, and medical. So I'll pass it back to Jack to start with women. I guess it's appropriate that we have the man talk about the, the, how, <laughs> how valuable of an asset women are to the organization. Um, we published a few years ago some research that we had done on the topic of women and, and leadership. Uh, our work was done on the basis of analyzing our 360-degree feedback 
uh, data that we had on some nearly 60,000 leaders, um, about two thirds of whom were male, about a little more than a third were female. Most were based in the US, and, but 45% but were outside uh, the United States. Um, I must confess that this whole idea often was, was triggered by an offhand comment that my friend Tom Peters one day made to me. Uh, it, Tom Peters was the, the, uh, the co-author of the book In Search of Excellence that became really the first popular kind of business book uh, in the last many decades. Anyway, one day Tom just in an offhand kind of way said, you know, Jack, I think women are better managers than men. Mm -hmm. And I was taken aback a little bit by that comment that he made this sort of from his own experience and observation. Uh, our research, we, we looked at overall leadership effectiveness and we looked at some specific data about different competencies shared by men and women. And so what, what came of our research was simply this, that overall, indeed, women are more effective leaders than men. Now, the differences aren't astronomical, they're not huge, but they're statistically significant. And part of our reason for championing this, this message was that we wanted any board of directors that's thinking about hiring a senior executive and they're comparing a woman versus a man, they should never take that into account as being something that would de detract from their making the choice of a woman. Uh, we wanted to help people understand that even at the different levels of an organization, women do very, very well. For example, in terms of overall leadership effectiveness at the middle management level, you can see that the women who are the, the, the green bar, 48.6% compared to men, 44.8. And you can see as you move up the hierarchy to senior levels of management, and then to the very top level of top management, that not only are women effective middle managers, they're very effective senior uh, executives. Mm -hmm. uh, we think that's an important message for us all to kind of digest because, you know, for, for many reasons, we've seen that in terms of the population, women are underrepresented as a rule in this, in this group. Let's talk a little bit about what happens over time. Uh, here we're going to show you the overall leadership effectiveness over time for males and females. The first line you're gonna see is for males. And what you see is that the overall effectiveness sort of generally declines uh, up until the age of 55 and 60. And then there takes a mysterious kind of bounce upwards uh, at the end. Uh, as the person on the call who's 91 years of age, I think that's going to go way, way, much, much higher <laughs> if, it were to, if it were to go on further. But no, compare this now to, to females. The women's scores, interestingly, begin to accelerate through those early years rather than decelerate. And then they flatten up, up a little bit, but then you see that they too become more effective over time. So the message is, women um, really enjoy a, a significant you know, lead um, over much of that, that, that span of time in their careers. The last thing we wanna show you is the more detailed analysis of, of, we measure 19 leadership competencies and we've listed them here. And what you'll see is that um, down at the bottom in dark blue, are three competencies, <clears throat> take risks, takes risks, technical and professional expertise, develops strategic perspective. Happens that those three men score slightly higher than women. On the one that's in a white bar making decisions, that's a statistical wash. But you'll see that there's this large group of, of competencies uh, that are in green, beginning with taking initiative learning agility, showing high integrity and honesty, driving for results, things that we sometimes have thought, well, you know, men may be a little bit better at that. Our data is not so. Uh, taking initiative, 
driving for results, inspiring, developing. These are all things that women tend to excel at. So bottom line, while the differences are not gigantic, they are statistically significant and do confirm what my friend Tom Peters said many years ago. Yeah, women are better leaders than men. <laughs> Amy? And confirms uh, what I kind of feel myself, uh, <laughs> shameless plug. Uh, I, I'm going to start uh, at furthering this story by just kind of bringing forth the lived experience. And so we're, we're on the hunt for hidden talent. And women do often have the lived experience of feeling overlooked or they need to shine more brightly in order to get noticed. And that's what Charlotte Witten here is saying. Uh, she's the first uh, female mayor of a major Canadian city, Ottawa in the 50s. And then she also kind of pointed at the idea that you have to have a fair amount of confidence to do it too. So let's, uh, let's start with um, debunking something that you may have heard. And so uh, I'll, I'll introduce that by sharing a story that comes from a person we all probably know, Cheryl Sand, not know directly, of course, Cheryl Sandberg from Facebook and the author of Lean In. And so she's telling her daughter a story of her own leadership. And she says, well, you know what? As I've been promoted, I've become less likable, but your dad can be promoted and he doesn't uh, have that same effect and she had expected her daughter to say something, well, that's not fair. But her daughter actually said something different, said, you know what, I'd rather be liked than promoted. Now, you may be familiar with this idea. Sometimes it's called the competence likability trap. So we have to choose one or the other. We've looked at competence and we see that women indeed are outpacing men relative to leadership effectiveness. So are they indeed taking a hit on their likability? Let's take a look. We're going to look at likability across uh, senior, seniority by men and women. We'll start with men. We can see that their likability does take a hit, unlike what Cheryl told her daughter. There is a little bit of a hit there for men. But what we find, interestingly for women, is they start out more likable and they stay more likable. So that's good news. We don't have to be trading off between one or the other. So here's uh, just a little tip for you as you think about this. If you're finding that there's an organizational lore um, or some kind of stories uh, that you hear people saying things like, well, you know, those senior women, they're just uh, tougher and harder to work with. You might want to move in to interrupt that bias um, and start to investigate where that really is coming from, um, because it's certainly not coming from the data. Let's look further at one of the competencies that Jack introduced in the, in the 19, and that's learning agility. And I would uh, say, at least from my own experience, as change is coming at us at faster and faster rates, learning agility is really the coin of the realm. We need to be able to learn and then unlearn and then learn again. It's never going to abate. So what happens to our ability to learn over time and when we look at gender? So we'll start with the men. Unfortunately, what we see here is a fairly alarming precipitous decline. Again, we have this mysterious leap at the end. So that's an interesting correlation between what we, sent, what we saw earlier. But men are really, it's a little bit of a slope here. Now, conversely, women start out with more learning agility and they're able to maintain that at higher rates over time. And if you look at here, um, if we compare this uh, 56 to 60, we're seeing a 10 point gap there. So if you're looking for le learners in your organization, women may be a really great place to, uh, to consider. The last thing I'm going to talk about is this idea of getting more women into senior ranks. This has clearly been something um, where uh, organizations are talking about, a, a problem that is um, uh, has been difficult to solve. Um, so before I get into this data, I just want to offer with regard to the CEO number. So this is looking at CEOs overall. If we just zoom into the Fortune 500, what we actually find is that women are represented at a rate of 10%. In looking at that a little further, just this gives me some, this heartens me a little bit. 
um, we are seeing quite a big increase. So in 2000, we had two um, women CEOs in the Fortune 500. Now in 2023, we have 47. So a 26-fold increase. So we are making progress. So don't let this 3% get <laughs> you down. However, the word of warning is, if women don't get a taste for higher levels of seniority earlier on in their career, they are more likely to opt out and say, you know what? all pass. So they, they take themselves out of contention in terms of being accelerated into greater rates. So if you want healthy um, senior uh, selection po possibilities with regard to women, you need to really keep that pool very wide at the bottom and give people the opportunity to grow sooner rather than later. So you're not stuck there going, well, there's no women to be to select from, which is what people say, right? I mean, that's that's at least what I've heard um, in the backroom um, boardroom. So I'm going to stop with this and we're now gonna turn our, our lens over to young supervisors. Amy, just before we make that transition, Please. finally, I'd just like to say how happy I am uh, to see that number of CEOs begin to, to move and the, the needle begins to kind of move upward. And maybe the Fortune 500 are going to be the bellwether uh, it, ap it appears that the Fortune mm. 500 are even better than overall corporate corporations in, in general. But to see 10, that become 10% is really encouraging. To, to it really me is. And, and something we should all kind of celebrate. Totally. Oh, and yeah. relatively, I mean, just to further that, Jack, a little bit, like when I looked at this and said, wow, you know, the year 2000 wasn't, at least from my perspective, that long ago, I was a working professional. So in my own working professional life, this has changed materially. That's exciting news. Yeah. And I guess it from, from 2021, it jumped up from 8% to, 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 to then 10% in, in, uh, in 22, which is just really, really gratifying. Okay. okay. Uh, the next group we want to talk about are young supervisors. Um, as, as you look at the data, that we have about when people are receiving their development, you'll see this bell-shaped curve. And what you see is that uh, the percentage of people receiving development in, in different, different age groups. And what you see is this, this bell-shaped curve where at a very young age, only people less than 25, only 3.2% of people uh, are, are participating and these data are being collected from, from our, our experience with a, a wide variety of companies worldwide. And we have the demographic data on, on the age of the participants. And so here you see the distribution. What I would call your attention to is note that those three bars on the left-hand side, they, they add up to a, a number that's about 23%. The three bars on the right-hand side, representing those people who are 51 years of age and older, 56, 61, those two add up to about 23%. So you see that one of the main messages we want to convey to you today is that we would, we would invite you to think hard about when are, you, when are we beginning to, be, to start this development process with people? And so the, the next slide talks about, so how, you know, yes, as you move up the ladder, people tend to be a little bit older. And, and most supervisors from our data, they're, they're first promoted into that position when they're around 27, 28 years of age. Mm -hmm. um, the average age of all supervisors is, is 41, as you see it there now. And then the same thing with, with middle managers and senior leaders. But the, the, the bottom line that we want to have you kind of consider is that many organizations have a, a long time span between when a person is first appointed to his or her position and when they are then given any significant formal development. And, and the, the nature of the kind of work that we do, where we provide 360 degree feedback for people as a way of diagnosing where they are in their career and their overall leadership abilities, that's often the first step that organizations use in their 
overall leadership journey. Uh, and our data would suggest that there's a, a nine year span between the, the average time when a person is first appointed to the time when they really begin to receive any serious development. A number of years ago, I was talking with the, the lady who was in charge of leadership development for a large um, high tech firm in Silicon Valley. And I said to her, Sharon, if you were doing this all over again, what would you do differently? Mm -hmm. And without hesitation, she said, Jack, we would begin a lot earlier. We wait too long. Uh, and, and that's the message, I guess, that we would like, we would invite you to kind of ponder, um, should we begin starting much earlier in developing leaders? Yes, it's incredible to see, right? And it, so perhaps then we say, well, the, the, the people can just go ahead and develop themselves. That left to their own devices, they'll do it on their own. Well, unfortunately, we don't find that to be the case. Um, organizations themselves need to convey um, quickly and clearly that development is, is important and support people with tangible ways to do that because only one in 10 will kind of take up this charge on their own. And so uh, ha, what are you going to do? What is our advice to you in terms of, of thinking about changing this paradigm, which when I looked at this data, I have to say, I was a, I was a little bit shocked. I, it was a little like, wow, like people are really waiting a long time in order to do this, what's going on here. So the first thing we would encourage you to do is to create a culture of development. So instead of it being a peripheral activity that kind of happens over here for some people, it's central. It's something that we're doing all the time and it's something that everyone is doing. The second thing that we would invite you to do as, as we've already noted, uh, you need to start this earlier. And the risk with not starting it soon enough and people actually practicing leadership before they've received any support to grow that skill is what I would call malpractice. And in fact, I um, have conversations with leaders um, that sound a little bit like this. So what is, um, how is your practice with regard to feedback? Oh, I, I've got a great practice. Let me tell you about it, Amy. The way I do feedback is I, I tell people um, what they're, what they need to change, but I make sure that I, I put, I surround that by all of these good things. So, so it can go down really smooth. And I have to say, unfortunately, you're muddling the message. It's not being clear. And we need to actually separate these two ideas um, in order for the feedback to take root. And they look at me a little bit shocked. They're like, well, I've been doing this for 10 years. This is, this is what I, my, my manager taught me this way. And so sometimes we get into some bad habits and then we practice those bad habits for a long time. And so we want to get into good habits more soon because then guess what we have the chance to do is develop mastery. Now, if you put me on the ski slope today, probably over the course of a week, I could marginally improve. Would I ever become a master skier? No, I started too late. So we need to start earlier implanting these good habits so then people can really practice them over time. And then they have something like the skill to give feedback at a master level when they're hitting this stride. They're 40 years old now, right? They're ready to be really demonstrating and giving more capacity. Uh, Clearly, there's a direct relationship between organizational performance and leadership effectiveness, and you can see some of these here. So employee engagement and retention, customer satisfaction, productivity, innovation, we understand, and you understand, I'm sure, on, on this call, this is vitally linked. And the sooner we're developing this capacity in terms of leadership effectiveness, the sooner your organization is going to benefit from better performance and results. The last uh, uh, idea here with regard to how do we start to rethink? Because that's what it really seems to me is we need to rethink 
how we're approaching leadership development, um, we need to get out of this idea of sinking or swimming mentality. And I, I just had a conversation with a leader I was coaching recently, and he said to me, Amy, you know, um, I'm noticing some of my people are sinking and some of them are swimming, and I'm starting to feel a little guilty about that. And I said, well, you should feel guilty about that. You have some responsibility here. And what he conveyed to me then was that the organization had this approach and that was done um, to him. That's the way he experienced it. So he was a little bit, he felt a little bit like he was going out on a limb here to change his practice because the organization was of the, of the mindset that we just let people sink or swim and they figure it out on their own. So if we're talking about we, we, we don't have enough talent, we're trying to find ways to discover that, um, to let people kind of wither on the vine seems to be a little bit wrongheaded. So we want to move in earlier um, to, to provide people this opportunity. So I'll pass it back to you, Jack, to continue our investigation here. Yeah, so many times, uh, people in organizations assume that, hey, the way you become a better leader is just miles on the road. It's experience. It's the more years you're there, the better you, you more skills you acquire. And this is all a, this is all a process of experience. The diagram that you see in front of you is uh, was an attempt to kind of say the the, the blue uh, portion of that diagram de depicts what individuals expect in terms of their career and what the organization sort of generally assumes would happen over a person's career, that they would become ever more valuable and therefore that would justify, you know, further salary increases and positions of responsibility. Uh, and, and that would be sort of kind of the ideal, you know, hope for uh, outcome. But some researchers, two researchers from Harvard University many years ago who did a study of what do what really happens, particularly with individual contributors, professionals in, in organizations, they saw that, yeah, there were a few people who kept getting better over time. But statistically, on average, after 15 or 20 years of experience, it began to decline. Mm. And so this notion that all we need to do is to give people more experience and years on the on the job is not is not correct. And so helping people to really think about how they manage their career, how they understand their career, what the stages are of a career, um, I think to reassure them that not everyone needs to be moving up in, in managerial positions to have a successful career. Mm -hmm. But if a person makes the decision to, to not do that, they need to do some other things. There are some things that they need to do to kind of stay abreast. So the four stages of careers that the researchers kind of identified were kind of this beginning novice where they, they learn the fundamentals. They're an apprentice. They come in and begin to understand how the organization functions and how their particular segment of that organization works. Then they become much more independent. They become able to, you know, make decisions on their own. Their their time frame kind of begins to be longer, and they apply their expertise. And this second stage of people's careers is one that some people elect to stay there their entire career. They love being an individual contributor. They they want to be uh, in at, at that position. But they need to understand that there are then things that you need to do to succeed at that. And the third stage of a career is then a team leader, a supervisor, some, some position that gives you not only responsibility for yourself, but that you now have responsibility for managing the activities and outcomes of others. And then finally, for a small number of people in the organization, there's the opportunity to be the pathfinder, the, 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 the strategic leader that kind of defines where the organization goes. Giving people an understanding early on in their career of what those stages are and helping them understand what they need to do if they choose to wanna to go through all four stages or through three stages, or if they wanna you know, stay in the, in the first two stages. Formal development 
and, and more investment early in people's careers makes the rest of their career all that much more productive. Mm -hmm. So let me toss it back to you. What needs to change, Amy? Well, we need to be able to promote from within. And so we've talked about that. And so firstly, we need to be able to identify the potential of these uh, leaders sooner. So it's like, I keep thinking about the, the nature of a lens. We need to turn our lens and say, wait a minute, where is that potential? How is it coming up? Mm -hmm. And providing these developmental opportunities. Um, I've had the pleasure of, of leading in a, an, an organizational fit fairly recently. And um, I have to say, one of the big challenges that organization faced was younger people were turning over at great ranks, people up here were not moving, and there was no career pathing or developmental focus. And it really created just a huge siphoning of talent continuously. In fact, the organization had something called an attrition goal. Um, and so it was seen as a way to, to, to support um, from a, from a, um, uh, a, a financial perspective. So yeah, clearly this was wrongheaded. <laughs> I needed to help them see um, the costs of, of this of this approach. Um, so, last, yeah, so yeah. the last point that I guess that we would like to make on, on this yeah. is that this general, there needs to be a much greater focus on the younger group. And, and I, as you look at the, the age ranges and, and what you see here in terms of the classic breakdown of generational groups, uh, what you see here is that by some statistics, mm. it would appear that organizations are spending about 88% of what of their development dollars on Gen X and older. Uh, I would take that number with a bit of a grain of salt. Mm. Whatever it is exactly, it, it, it really is a good reminder to all of us, are we allocating our effort and our dollars? with the groups that really will predict our future and will help shape our future. And that's the message that we would like to kind of leave with you about this, this group of, of wonderful young supervisors that, that are a talent pool that need developing early. Indeed, indeed. Uh, let's now take our lens and, and place it over the individual contributors. And so when we think about this pool of leaders, um, we've started to discuss them as almost forgotten leaders because their titles uh, are things like analyst, senior accountant, engineer, chemist. So the question to you is, when you think about your own organizational system, do you talk about individual contributors in terms of their leadership capacities? Are they influencing others? And is really this idea of individual contributor leader an oxymoron? Let's start by looking at what we found um, with regard to other research on leadership development and how organizations do this. And so you may be familiar with John Katzenbach's work. I have one of his books here, Wisdom of Teams. I refer to this a lot when working with teams he was commissioned to do a worldwide study of leadership development. How do we develop these rarefied creatures called leaders? He was encouraged by a Marine to go look at the Marine Corps. And so after figuring out how to get this uh, uh, relationship in place, he thought he'd go spend a few days with them. He ended up spending about two weeks. In this, the course of this investigation and research, what he um, found was that he was very impressed with how the Marines were approaching leadership. And it was because in my way of thinking, they decoupled hierarchy and leadership. And they said, leadership is something, it's a skill that people at all levels of the organization um, have and do and exercise. Um, it's not an elitist activity just for some of these rarefied people that have reached, us, reached rungs of, of positional authority, but instead something that we all need to grow. And his conclusion was the best leaders of the, of the world were going to really um, employ this approach. And so let's just now take a look at individual contributors and ask the question, well, how important are they really? Well, the first thing is it's very clear that they hold the lion's share of the work. That's where the rubber meets the road. That's where the hamburgers are being made. That's where the, the, 
um, the technology is, uh, the code is being written, if you will. They are in the course of doing this, providing vital leadership, keeping people aligned, making sure the project's running forward, giving people feedback, building relationships. And they are the pool for future, more senior levels of responsibility. They're learning how the firm works at its most fundamental. And if you're connecting these dots, you can start to see, if you think about the, this, the stages of contribution and how one moves through this progress, they're ripe for taking on more responsibility if they want it. They are also the followers. And so they're the folks who are connecting the dots between what's going on up here all the way to the, to the, to the bottom line delivery, if you will. And so we would say that individual contributor leader is not an oxymoron. And in fact, let, leadership is occurring at all levels of the organization. And I would imagine when you tap into your own experience, you probably find this to be true as well. I'll turn it back to you, Jack. Yeah, so I'm, I hope that most of you on the call are familiar with a man named Peter Drucker. Uh, he passed away a few years ago, but uh, he was an extraordinarily astute observer of, of organizations and how they could function best. And I think he summed up uh, what we've been talking about in a very really, you know, concise way. The most effective organizations are those that enable ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And uh, that certainly is um, the, the mantra that we would hope that organizations would consider about how do we how do we help people at all levels uh, rise to the occasion? We, we would emphasize that there isn't a huge difference between people who are very effective at, at in, being individual contributors and their managerial counterparts. That, that yes, there are a couple of things that managers tend to score higher on. Uh, and you, on the chart, we've shown what they are, that they do tend to be a little bit higher on technical competence, they're a little bit higher on initiative, that is the, the individual contributors are, but they're lower on strategic thinking, lower on building relationships, lower on setting stretch goals. So again, these are kind of nuanced differences. They're not statistic, they're not, they're not huge, but mm -hmm. they are statistically significant. Mm -hmm. uh, we would, yeah, so, we would then, then kind of move on and say, Amy, how do we best go about developing this group? Yeah, the good news here for everybody is that we don't need to create a totally different roadmap. So we're seeing that the, the gap, if you will, between managerial and leadership um, uh, skills and what we would term as tech, uh, kind of classical individual skills, are, there's not a huge um, crevasse. And in fact, the approach that we use for developing leaders is the same approach that works for individual contributors. We have a program like that called Exceptional Performer. And in fact, what it starts with is getting uh, feedback from people. Um, who are my stakeholders and how do they see me? How do they see my skills? As we start to get a hold of this, we can then say, is there anything really problematic with what I'm doing? And if so, I need to get that moved out of the way as quickly as possible. So I can really move to the feast, which is identifying what I'm best at, what I most enjoy, and connecting that to what the organization needs. So if this sounds a lot like what you do for your leaders in terms of their development, Yay, because you can you can employ that same approach for your individual contributors. So again, we're trying to draw um, the parallel a little bit more closely. So we're not feeling like these individual contributors are stuck um, or kind of almost like this may be a little bit provocative, but almost like second class citizens in a way they're not. And so we we. Um, we uh, are doing injustices um, when we think of them that way. And in fact, um, when we do think of individual contributors as less than, if you will, um, there's some big risks. Um, these folks are very vulnerable um, to leaving um, if they're not well cared for. They can take their bag of, of tools and skills and move them quickly and easily to another organization. And when they do that, they leave a big hole. And um, I've been an experienced organizational 
um, changes like this, where people are like, oh no, well, who, who does, how do we do that? I don't know. Well, well, Mary always took care of that. Well, I'm not sure. And there's a lot of, of uh, quickly um, spackling over the, the hole that's been left there. So, well, how can you uh, focus your attention to ensure that your individual contributors are feeling the love? Well, the first way I would um, offer is to stop, if you are, stop treating them like a cog um, and really understand that their work um, needs to feel meaningful, purposeful, and that there's a sense, sense of mastery in it. Um, they're not simply this cog in this big wheel holding this rote, routinized work. And in doing that, the senior leaders must um, really rec respect and dignify that work, that it that um, the workers aren't seen as kind of fungible, um, like uh, 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 names, faceless uh, folks or kind of employee numbers, um, particularly in big organizational systems when we're looking at categories of employees and we're looking at their averages, it becomes a little dehumanized and the work can be dehumanized in that same way. So we wanna just make sure we're stating that off. and. Lastly, coming back to a key idea, um, organizations must signal that development is important. They must support it overtly. If they don't, people are going to be less likely to take that up. And so we need to move in with developmental programs, creating more reciprocity. So as an individual contributor brings their best self forth, the organization is meeting them with support just to say, yes, 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 continue to grow, we need you. So again, we're talking about talent shortage. We, we certainly want to close the, the, the bathtub um, so it's not leaking out the other side. <laughs> Let's look at STEM experts, Jack. All right, you bet. <clears throat> so let me tell you the backstory of, oh. of, this, of this category. Um, so about a year, a little more than a year ago, one of our international partners came to us and said, you know, we think that there's an interesting difference between leaders in the so-called STEM disciplines and the, those in the non-STEM disciplines. And so by STEM disciplines, this so we're all together talking about science, technology, engineering, mathematics, and medical kind of pro professional skills. Um, they said, you know, would, would you have work with us in looking at the data that you have and let's just see if if our if our observation has any validity to it. A little bit like Tom Peters and saying women are better managers than men. <laughs> this, was, this was an observation, but with with no data. Uh, so uh, Joe, uh, our resident psychometrician statistician, uh, jumped in with them and began to look at the data. And sure enough, we found a really interesting phenomenon. Sure enough, as you look at both separating out males and females in STEM disciplines and non-STEM organizations, what you see is, again, the, the, blue, the blue bar is our companies that are in the non-STEM arena, and the green bar are those in the STEM arena. And what you see is for men, there's a pretty major difference, and for women, there's a pretty major difference. Um, so I, I want to paint the picture kind of so we can all maybe think about it uh, broadly, and that is these may be organizations that in total tend to be very STEM-oriented. They're, they're very scientifically or, you know, oriented organizations. Or it may be those people within a bigger organization who are in the disciplines that are highly STEM-oriented, the R&D function, the quality assurance function. Um, so we would invite you just to kind of think about this data, which, which is that why this occurs, we, we don't know. Is it because people who are attracted to the STEM disciplines tend to spend a lot of their early life in getting really expert at that discipline and don't pay so much attention to other things? Is it a natural selection in terms of personality types and all that? We don't pretend to know the, the, the why answer at this moment, but we do know that there's, there's a difference. So the, the thing we would invite you to kind of think about is, um, you know, what do we do? How, how do we go about re responding to, to this? And so on what 
what made the difference between these two groups, just so we can all be pretty clear, that the STEM leaders were rated as less effective on things like being customer oriented, having an external focus, being less effective at inspiring other people, less effective at communication skills, less effective at developing others and in practicing teamwork and collaboration. They weren't as good at championing change. They weren't as, they weren't as adept at strategic thinking. Um, and interestingly enough, they, they were not as, uh, they didn't score as highly on innovation, mm -hmm. nor did they set stretch goals. Clearly they excelled at the, the, at the technical expertise and the knowledge of their industry and the, the knowledge of, of the technology that, that undergirds that. But we would invite you all uh, as thinking about this fourth category of people in your organizations who may be wonderful potential leaders of the future, but they just need some very specific added development to, to equip them for, for these opportunities. Uh, if we can provide um, impactful leadership development earlier in these people's careers, mm -hmm. we think you could make a real difference. Uh, Organizations now often provide further technical education, but they fail to balance that with the other developmental skills. And some of you make all the soft skills, but but you know the soft skills are the hard skills, and and they are very much required to be an excellent leader. So, Amy, you can yeah. summarize all this. <laughs> <laughs> on one page, we'll summarize all of this wisdom. Uh, and really, we do hope this supports you. And I'm, I'm sure that it, this the different group types are resonating with you in different ways. We've taken you on a tour of the, the characteristics of these um, folks and why we would encourage you to keep digging there. Uh, so we've looked at women um, and their capabilities that may go unnoticed, the young supervisors who are getting not as much development sooner in their career as possible, the individual contributors who have been put in a box that really um, they need to be kind of let out of, if you will, and then this, this compelling evidence with STEM experts, which does, it does coincide with my own um, kind of anecdotal research just in terms of these differences. So what an opportunity there for organizations. And then layering that on top of what I think is being termed the silver tsunami, as folks are, are retiring in the baby boomer at greater rates, um, the pipeline for talent is only going to increase in terms of its importance. And so you can hear our perspective. It's finding the people within your, within your walls and really focusing on their development to help their uh, potential come forth. And we'll leave you with this quote, quote before I pass it over to my colleague, Brianne, um, from Russell Conwell, who, um, who he was famous for doing a, a talk around the acres of diamonds. And this was a story that he shared about a, a gentleman who was looking for diamonds and he, was, he sold his plot of land to go off into the mountains to find them. Another guy bought it and indeed found diamonds right there in the backyard. And so the idea here is that the talent that you're seeking may be closer than you think. You just have to dig a little bit for it. So that's what I would encourage you to do. And I'll have, hand it over to you, Brianne, please. Thank you, Amy and Jack. That was wonderful. I um, was reading the comments. There were a lot of comments for this webinar. And it was really interesting of, of some people who, who talked about, you know, my organization just doesn't really give a lot of opportunities. And I had a conversation with Jack earlier this month when we were recording our 90th percentile podcast. And he said that one of the most gratifying elements of a leader's job is watching those very unexpected people um, when they're given this opportunity and they completely surprise you. And there are so many people within your organization that if you give them the chance, they will surprise you. And I hope this webinar helped get the wheels turning for ways that you can open your leadership pipelines and increase your bench strength. Um, I met a vendor the other day and uh, it was interesting. I was really excited about their product and wanted to learn more. And at the end of the conversation, we talked about price and they told me and I went, 
that's completely unattainable for my budget and probably 90% of budgets out there. But they only had one option, one, that was it. And I was so disappointed. And at Zenger Folkman, we want extraordinary leadership to be accessible to everyone, not just a select few at the top of the organization. It's our mission to build better leaders at all levels. And whether you're doing our full extraordinary leader initiative and assessment, or if your team is just coming to learn a leadership skill and do a micro session with us, we want to build better leaders. And we're here to do that at all budgets, at all levels. So um, we talked about in this webinar, you said in your late forties, people are getting these skills and it shouldn't be that. It should be at the beginning of your careers. So uh, we'd love to have a conversation with you. Please reach out. Let us know if you have organization needs and in issues. We've been in this industry for a very long time, and we have the resources to help you make positive changes. And you're not going to walk away from that conversation disappointed. Um, you can see in the next slide, um, we have a link to a survey. Um, that you can indicate if you are interested in having a conversation with us and um, you can fill out some other questions on that. And just to entice you to do that survey, we are giving away a few free copies of Joe Folkman's best-selling book, The Trifecta of Trust. Um, we're also giving an option where you can have the audio book or the ebook or the physical book. So be sure to fill out that survey. Let us know your feedback on this webinar. We love to hear it. And I have just one more thing I wanna tell you about before you go is that finally, after three years of absence, we are bringing back our Zenger Folkman events. Uh, we are going to be doing lots of different speeches across the country and development experiences. We love coming on here and doing these live online webinars and being able to reach hundreds and hundreds of you, but um, it's just so different meeting in person and seeing your face and being able to ask questions and have that shared experience. So sh be sure to sign up for our um subscribe to our newsletter to get updates on when those events will happen or you can always visit our website and see our events page to see that as well thank you for attending this webinar today and we hope you join us for the next one next month <music>